While mighty golden dragons commune across dreamscapes and monitor the more cosmic influences on the world of Toril and beyond, the silver dragons actively fight the forces of evil, self-appointed paladins very much involved in their own culture, waiting for the days to come again when each is lord, protector, kings and queens or regents serving in the more aloof gold dragon stead as rulers of the world. The bronze and brass dragons are generals and marshals of forces, strategists and commanders, the bronze love of warfare and the history of conflict, the brass love of information and clever tactics. The copper dragons are somewhat different. In many ways the copper dragons are the flip side of the black dragon. The foreboding sense of dread one feels in the pit of the stomach when entering the territory of a black dragon is instead replaced with a light and giddy feeling where the copper dragon is nearby. Instead of a shriek coming easily from the lungs, instead it's chuckles and giggles at even the most faintly humorous things. Both dragons are very focused on other creatures around them. In the case of the black dragon, it is a terrible, obsessive lust to kill and cause suffering. They are creatures that course with the energy of decay, spite and hatred, while copper dragons are obsessed with pranks, laughter, acquiring cool stuff and making sure everything is running smoothly, and the creatures around them are happy, healthy and don't take life too seriously. They are known as the dragons who are friends to man. They are patrons of artists and bards. They love to attend festivals and will often take on the guise of a jovial priest who performs blessings and wedding ceremonies, just so they always have a good excuse to attend as many celebrations as they can. While black dragons drain vitality from the world around them, the copper dragons instead enrich it. They fizz with it. They have an irrepressible nature that can be exhausting to other creatures attempting to keep up with them. But they are also social butterflies, never spending too long in one party or another. After all, they can consume enormous amounts of food and drink, so spreading their activities and entertainment across several weddings, celebrations and whatnot during a couple of days is a good way to ensure they are a welcome guest, not a burdensome one. In the wild, copper dragons preferred the terrain of arid, broken hills, ravines and badlands, the dry and sandy monuments of stone that form mesas and the backdrop of classic western movies. They are very agile in flight, making use of these difficult and tight confines, cliffs and chasms to dart through the air like seals zip through rocks on a shore with surging currents and crashing waves. Copper dragons spin around dust devils with delight. They leap from sheer drops and pull out of power dives with graceful ease, only a few feet from the ground, snapping up a rabbit or a chicken or some such. Their elemental influence permeates the environment, the springs flow with sweet water, the plants grow a little bit faster, and desert flowers bloom a little longer, and the worst conditions of such a rough and rugged habitat are eased somewhat. Small game thrives, people in the area have better luck with farming and medicinal herb gathering, livestock is less prone to disease and people have more free time. Time enough to have celebrations, to share the excess of their harvest and to show appreciation for the dragon. They know the dragon is behind the good fortune, they can feel it. Also, metallic dragons have a great love of cavorting in their chosen environment in their natural form. Of course they do, who wouldn't? They are also quite comfortable with their own power to experience life in the shapes of other creatures in the world around them. For copper dragons this is usually humanoids, humans in particular. And here is the fun thing that copper dragons know. Humans have always been on Toril, in one form or another. They are truly ancient species, much like the dragons. They have adapted and changed, thrived and declined, had moments of wonder where they reached the power of the gods, and still, even after getting slapped back down in disastrous conflagration and ruin, they survived, they adapted, and are on the rise again. The elves are recent arrivals by comparison, the dwarves even more so. Orcs have been on the planet for a very long time as well, and other races once common on the surface such as the furred and fierce Quaggoth now reside solely in the Underdark. Many, many others have perished, gone extinct. Only some relics and some parts of very old spells remain. Their ruins and culture now long gone and forgotten. Copper dragons don't get hung up on the sorrow of these losses. It's just part of life, the cycle of things. Nothing can be done about it, so why worry? Life is for living and enjoying, for experiencing and those magical moments. Their long association for humanoids has given them a great appreciation for the artwork of these races. Particularly fine metalwork, tapestries, sculpted objects, paintings and all manner of fine jewellery. Which is handy as they tend to gain a few very nice items every year as tributes and gifts from appreciative folks. But also a source of constant temptation for copper dragons. As good-natured as most of them are, they do have a serious weakness for greed, and the dwarves call it the dragon sickness. 
And copper dragons, much as they joke around and love a good prank, they really, really love a good caper as well. And the art of the heist is one of their key strengths in the great game. Oh, the great game, Zorvintal. I should probably talk about that since they completely missed it out in Fizzband's Guide on Dragons, unbelievably. Since we're on the subject of one of the dragon species that play it quite a bit, and I can quote 3.5 editions Monster Manual 5 directly. A few dragons, young and old, devote their lives to a competition called Zorvintal, the great game. They scheme against their fellows, wagering their hordes and manipulating their minions like chess pieces. Sometimes those that don't directly serve a dragon find themselves caught up in the game. Dragons choose to take up Zorvintal when they're young adults, drawn by the allure of besting their fellow dragons and the promise of vast treasure. But the great game demands commitment from its players. Dragons are proud and solitary creatures, so Zorvintal is one of the few ways a dragon can earn draconic prestige. Masters of Zorvintal are regarded as the finest minds among dragonkind, and that is saying something. Some legendary dragons, such as the other dimensional niv are so intelligent they can concentrate on two spells simultaneously, and are simply immune to illusion magics of any kind. I'll let that sink in for a moment. To join the great game, a dragon must first research and perform the ritual of Zorvintal. The ritual requires the dragon to spend a month meditating in a magic cocoon. When the dragon emerges, it is forever marked as a dragon of the great game, having sacrificed its innate spellcasting ability for the ability to manipulate its minions, to interact telepathically with other Zorvintal dragons, and to gain power as it advances in the great game. This is a psionic transformation, the Crystal Mind, but for the purposes of 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, it's a set of spell-like abilities. I imagine the next edition will be able to represent this even more accurately with tailored spell actions individual dragons can take. Zorvintal is not really a practical ability for combat encounters, but it does allow a dragon to command allies with unexpected power. The other side effect of the transformation is that it locks the Zorvintal dragons into the rules and conditions of the great game. They literally can't break the rules, kind of like devils can't break laws, without simultaneously driving themselves insane. And not the, ah, I'm a wicked evil dragon now insane, the drawing pictures in their own blood locked in a chamber forever kind of insane. Zorvintal takes years to learn and centuries to play. Only dragons understand the finer points of the rules, and this is kind of an important point. At its heart, Zorvintal is a convoluted mess of seeming contradictions and exceptions that only dragons have the time and tenacity to figure out. <laughs> you could figure it out. Get yourself a lawyer, son. Make it a real good one. This game plays for keeps, and it's in it for the long run. Direct dragon versus dragon combat is forbidden in the great game except for rare circumstances. The game can be brutal enough as it is without the dragons also weakening themselves by fighting each other, leaving themselves vulnerable to other creatures. Dragons certainly prefer to be top of the food chain at all times. Weak dragons getting picked off by lesser creatures makes them all look bad, so the direct combat is off the cards. Zorvintal dragons use lackeys to take over one another's territory and hordes, but they must also place their hordes and lairs at risk. Zorvintal has a feudal element as well, with older, successful players taking on new player under their wings. The new player that does well earns esteem and influence for its older draconic patrons, and the older dragon earns a share of the younger dragon's horde and of its future conquests. This means there's a deep history and lineage of play, like kung fu masters and schools of martial arts styles. Some moves are classic hallmarks of a particular tradition, with classic counter moves like chess, while some gambits have fairly chaotic results, but each result is well known and a cherished outcome. Points are scored for pretty rare and dicey outcomes that are handled particularly well by a Zorvintal player. It's not really important exactly how it's played. As the DM, it's a tool in your storytelling arsenal. The player characters may face powerful draconic minions who act in a manner contrary to what they expect. It's like some totally narcissistic Jedi Council is pulling the strings behind the scenes. And on the rare occasion you as DM choose to let your players penetrate the mystery, they should be faced with a game of epic cat and mouse, where the dragons are the cats and the player characters are most certainly the mice. After all, Minions who think they know what is going on are just another element in the great game. I assure you, they don't really know, and they are most likely quite expendable. Copper dragons play the game well. After all, it's not about how physically powerful they are, so there are marked advantages to them to become Zorvintal players. 
One of which is the fact that they share a favoured territory with Dread Dragons, the mightiest and most in-your-face chromatics. This is not good for coppers, they can't compete with a red dragon unless it's significantly younger than them, or seriously incapacitated, which is not off the table, copper dragons are not bound to fighting a fair fight, which is more like what the silver dragons do. No, frustrating and humiliating a red dragon via traps and tricks and then beating it when it's down is about the only way they can win, and it's just going to make things worse unless they kill the red dragon or mate with it. Cinder or caldera dragons are one of the possible outcomes of a crossing between these two breeds, but where a chromatic is involved, the resulting offspring is never really predictable. One species of draconic creatures that are particularly drawn to the side of both copper and red dragons are the winged kobolds, known as urds. All dragons attract the tireless services and fawning worship of the clever little kobolds, but urds are a special case. They're not really part of the riffraff, they have an attitude. They also act very differently around other draconic races as opposed to how they react to mammal species. They don't like mammals very much. Around good dragon masters, they will be on their best behaviour. Around evil dragons, they are encouraged to act on their natural revulsion and seething spite directed at mammal humanoids in particular. They're very sneaky, very cunning, and on the orders of their dragon master, they will befriend and put up with all the abuse and stupid questions and suspicion of an adventuring party until eventually the stupid monkey people will allow the kobolds to lead them right to their doom. Every time I double cross a table full of players with yet another cute and friendly kobold, they always seem so shocked. Quick tip, never get back with a cheating ex and never trust a kobold completely. Be particularly wary of urds who walk with you. They fly, so they are leading you to a pit trap of some kind. Mark my words. From a copper dragon's point of view, kobolds are great! Like little tinker gnomes who mine tirelessly for gems and precious metals to gift to them. The copper dragons trade modest amounts of time in order to get the stuff transformed into stunning works of art by other species. The kobolds don't have the sense of style for really amazing jewellery. If mineral deposits are particularly poor in the area, the kobolds will still carve many warrens and chambers into the hills and mountains, but they will take to stealing precious loot for their master's lair instead. The copper dragon is just greedy enough that sometimes they don't ask their minions where the loot comes from, when deep down they know the little kobolds are up to no good. Sometimes even the best dragons show a lot of bias towards kobolds, like pet cats who kill the neighbor's birds. Oh no, surely it was not my lovely cat. Oh yes it was. Another sort of dragon worship going on with a diverse bunch of races is the infamous Cult of the Dragon, but that is worthy of a video all of its own in the Dragon series. In their natural form, copper dragons are recognisable by a few key features. In flight, the first is their distinctive wings, a lot like the gold dragon, they extend from the shoulders with the membrane tapering down to the back legs, but also running right down each side of their long tail. Their body is lean and strong, with a shorter skull than other metallics. Two prominent horns sweep back from the brow, and there are two solid fins sweeping back from the cheeks, protecting their eyes very well. Their jaw also sports some frills, and the horns on the head often have quite pronounced scales on them. The scales on their body generally overlap and form very solid protection. The scales are large and glossy, forming bands or plates that are smooth to the touch, but extremely durable. A scrape from a rock outcrop as they zoom through a tight turn in a twisted canyon is about the same sort of force the sweeping claw of a rival dragon can inflict. An unskilled strike with a longsword is likely to just bounce off them. As an adult, copper dragon has an armor class of 18 and between 96 and 272 with an average of 184 hit points. Their eyes are brilliant turquoise and unlike brass dragons who gradually become fully metallic in appearance, even their eyes, or the bronze who always have those patterns of green stripes on their scales, the copper dragon gradually develops this vivid green on the outer edges of the wing membranes and between the bands of scales, so it looks like the copper rust or verdigris you see on copper statues, domed rooftops and so on. Copper dragons have two modes of breath weapon attack, like all metallics, one that slows victims, and the other is a potent line of acid, and it should be mentioned that this acid also serves a dual purpose of stripping precious metals out of raw ore, and greatly assists the hardworking kobolds in their mining efforts for the dragon. It may surprise you also that a lot of thieves guilds are secretly run by copper dragons, shapeshifted into humanoid alter ego only transforming back into dragon form when they're safely away from prying eyes, spending time flying, hunting, eating a lot, and having a long sleep among one of their stashes of fabulous wealth. Then returning to the guild and the hustle bustle of humanoid life. I'm not saying these copper dragons are always evil, they're just extremely greedy and covetous. 
the thieves guilds, bandit camps, brigades for blades for hire and those non-humans who tend to attack innocent homesteaders and wide-eyed tourists are a resource that they can use to gather wealth as well. Metallic dragons vary greatly in how long they spend in humanoid disguise. The copper is one of the more comfortable in that form, particularly the players of Zorvental. So, masters of a thieves guild, a wedding celebrant, leader of a druid circle or bardic college, the copper dragon can wear many different guises. Dragons tend to sleep for longer and longer periods of time as they grow beyond adulthood. In old school D&D, there was always a percentage chance that a dragon encountered in its lair would be sound asleep. The challenge was then getting some of its well-protected treasure without waking the dragon and dealing with its wrath. Copper dragons, despite being metallics, are not dragons that you want to try that with. They will certainly be very, very angry, and while not exactly intending to murder a party of adventurers, they are very powerful creatures and mistakes happen. You may be getting the idea around about now that copper dragons are far more complicated than the happy-go-lucky, friendly pranksters you always assumed that they were. And it may also shock you a little that metallic dragons in 5th edition have had their shape-changing ability seriously nerfed by restricting it to only ancient dragons for the most part. I don't find that to be at all supported in the lore, and it's really boring, so feel free to ignore that nonsense. You may want to limit it a little for young dragons so that they can only polymorph into a set humanoid form for as many hours as they have constitution points, something like that. There are older source books for Dungeons and Dragons that allow you to play a young dragon as a playable character. This is nothing new. And generally, it's quite difficult to play one in a campaign, not because they're so powerful, but because they level up a hell of a lot slower than any other player character race. Back in the old days, um, it was possible that players would be different levels of characters in the same campaign. They would level up at different rates, and also people lose experience points and levels in old editions of the game. So while the other players are, uh, say, level 7, the dragon character is still halfway through level 2, or some such. It kind of sucks unless the players are all dragons. There is an old source book called Council of Worms designed to run a campaign just like that. Copper dragon lairs are as narrow and twisting as the terrain they prefer to fly through. They hide many antechambers full of treasures and resources, easily overlooked with the many choke points and switchbacks turns leading to their main chambers and hidden behind false walls and things. Any treasure that is openly on display is actually the least expensive stuff the dragon owns. Flashy stuff to draw the attention of stupid burglars who will dash off with the first armful of loot they can grab. Within their lair, copper dragons have greatly enhanced influence over the earth around them. They can cause a 20 foot area of spikes to thrust from the floor within 120 feet. Same effect as a spike growth spell. They can also transform 10 foot areas of their lair into chest deep bogs of mud. They can cause the effect to reverse, often trapping victims up to their armpits in solid stone. In the region permeated with the supernatural presence of a powerful copper dragon, magic carvings of the dragon's smiling face can be seen worked into pillars, surfaces, walls, large boulders and so on within six miles of the dragon's lair. Somewhat bizarre is that small creatures and birds that are normally unable to speak gain the magical ability to speak and understand draconic while within one mile of the dragon's lair. These creatures speak well of the dragon, but can't divulge its whereabouts. Finally, any intelligent creature within one mile of the dragon's lair are prone to fits of giggling. Even serious matters seem suddenly amusing. This is quite noticeable, even for stoic murder hobo player characters, so there's some player buy-in required here. A copper dragon appreciates wit, a good joke, a humorous story, or a riddle. Copper dragons become annoyed with any creature that doesn't laugh at its jokes or accept its tricks with good humor. And a copper dragon is wary when it comes to showing off its possessions. If it knows that other creatures seek a specific item in its hoard, the copper dragon will not admit to possessing the item. Instead, it might even send curious treasure hunters on a wild goose chase to find the object which while it watches afar with its own pleasure. My name is AJ Pickett. If you have any questions about Copper Dragons for me or interesting facts to share with the community about your experiences with Copper Dragons in your games, please comment down below. And in the meantime, I'm off to enjoy a tasty beverage and I'll be back with more D&D lore for you very soon. Thank you.